So the title of my topic is the geopolitics of nostalgia from memory wars to the war in Ukraine. And it's really a, uh, an amazing time in which, um, a terrible and amazing time in which uh, we're having this school and I'm giving this lecture uh, because uh, six months ago, half a year ago, uh, one uh, couldn't have imagined the extent of what is happening now. It's if we, as if we're living in the middle of the Second World War. Uh, we are just in the midst of a major armed conflict in Europe. Uh, the conflict of the size of the Second World War, with uh, the number of uh, you know troops involved, uh, the Russian invasion army, with the number of human loss, uh, the you know close to 10 million people, uh, uh, displaced people, uh, the Ukrainians, uh, the number of losses. Uh, the Pentagon has just revealed uh, that Russia has already lost close close to 75,000 uh, people. And we're just in the beginning of this war, probably. Uh, it will probably last for another year, two, three years, nobody knows. So it's just, uh, we are in the middle of the making of some new world and we're trying to make sense of it. And we're trying to understand how this became possible. And uh, in order to understand this, I think we have to turn to memory wars which have been raging uh, all across uh, the world, uh, but especially in Russian foreign policy uh, for many years now. So um, I'd like to start with this uh, tremendous photo by Associated Press. Uh, this was made in uh, May in the uh, village of uh, Konstantinovka in uh, Lugansk uh, area. And it shows a uh, battlefield, actually, as any Ukrainian town has now become a battlefield, in the middle of which we have a military memorial. That's a Soviet wartime tank. Actually, it's not the famed T-34. It's the ES-1 tank, uh, Yosef Stalin Adin. Uh, and uh, around this, we see the destroyed Russian uh, military equipment. And I think it's tremendously symbolic, this photo, because it shows the two wars combined. It shows uh, uh, the Second World War, which became an inspiration for this, the memory of which became an inspiration for Russia in fighting a new war. Uh, we see the tank. Uh, and the, you know, the entire Russian territory is dotted with this uh, war memorials with the old tanks standing on pedestals. In Russia, usually all these tanks are oriented towards the West. Uh, their guns are looking towards the West. Uh, as always, like all the other war memorials when we have various warriors, soldiers, so they are all looking West. Russia is always stressing in its memory policy that it's been fighting the West forever. And uh, uh, so we see uh, that the tank is more or less intact. And it is striking that, uh, in a sense, this tank, uh, the whole historical idea of this memorial has served as a pretext for the real war. The dead people, the memory of the dead people has taken away the living people. The dead are taking the living. That's uh, the essence of this war. And uh, let me cite you another couple of episodes um, uh, from this war. For instance, um, because you know the war didn't really start uh, on 24th of February this year. The war has been going on for eight years already, the war of Russia against Ukraine, starting with the annexation of Crimea in March, uh, in late February, early March, uh, uh, to 2014. And I'm reminded of the uh, episode uh, from uh, the earlier war from uh, 2014, the war in Donbass, when in the nearby Donetsk region, uh, the Russian uh, occupying forces and the, well, the local uh, militias, uh, the local guerrillas, have also discovered a similar tank on the pedestal. Uh, another Yes, one tank, Yosef uh, Stalin, one tank. Uh, and they've managed to take off the pedestal, 
to sort of reassemble it, revive it. Uh, they've repaired uh, the gun of this tank and they started firing shells at the Ukrainian positions. So that's also striking how uh, the wartime tank, which was probably 75 years of age, was taken off the pedestal and started shooting. It's another metaphor of this war. And an even more striking metaphor, uh, the military commander of um, the Russian forces, or rather of the like, combined forces, the local plus Russian forces in Donbas in 2014-2015, uh, the famous military reconstructor Igor Girkin, Strelkov, was uh, executing people using the orders from Joseph Stalin from 1942 from the war period. So people were shot in Donetsk using the orders of a long dead state, the orders of Yosef Stalin from the Soviet Union of 1942. So that's another striking example of how the past grabs us. The past is grabbing the living people. So it's like a horror movie with zombies resurrecting from under the ground and grabbing uh, the real living people. Another uh, episode which I can cite is that, you know, one of the key characters in this war, uh, in the Russia's war against Ukraine, is no one else than Mr. Vladimir Medinsky, who was the culture minister of the Russian Federation and uh, who is uh, one of the key protagonists of the memory war. He is the architect of the Russian memory policy. Uh, that uh, was constructed for the past 10 years and that largely contributed to this war. And uh, during the first months of war, it was Medinsky who was heading the negotiations on the Russian side with the Ukrainian relation. And once again, think I led not by a military general, not by a high level uh, politician led by a sort of a culture personality. It is led by a historian, which is yet another proof that this war, this entire war was invented in memory, in history, and then projected into reality of 2022. Uh, so my, the main message here is that uh, the real source of this war lies in memory, lies is in nostalgia. And this is really probably the first war of this proportion in the world history, which is fought completely out of memory. So um, if we look at this from the point of view of uh, international relations, and you know, there, there is theories explaining international relations. One is realism in which uh, the states are pursuing the innate state interests and, uh, you know, clashing for the national interest. And another is liberalism, uh, when, uh, you know, the war, uh, not, not war necessarily, but the entire international relations is fought uh, for institutions and economic interests. And here we have a clear cut case of constructivism. When wars are fought and relations are made for the sake of identity, for the sake of memory. And once again, we have the figure of memory coming out as the key source of this war and of international relations in general. So um, it is um, uh, the specific uh, complex of memories, especially embodied by Vladimir Putin himself, who has become a key historian in recent years, right? His many of his public pronouncements over the past several years have been about history. He was writing uh, the articles the very extended articles on the history of the Second World War to prove the unique Soviet role in winning this war, 
to prove that the West has been, uh, you know, resisting Russia's attempts to defeat fascism, to prove that Russia was indeed, uh, as he believes, fighting fascists alone um, in, um, um, in the Second World War. So uh, it is the inflamed imagination of Vladimir Putin and his personal memory crusade that was at the nucleus of this war. It was at the origins uh, of this war. So, and in the end, uh, the suicidal war, and indeed it is for Russia, this war is suicidal, was born uh, against any geopolitical rationality, against any economic interest. What we're seeing now, apart from the tragedy of Ukraine and of the Ukrainian people, but what we're seeing is also unprecedented act of political suicide of Russia, political, economic, human suicide. Uh, what's happening, I would call the anthropological catastrophe. Russia is killing its hopes for the future. Russia is killing whatever it has achieved in the past 30 years of transformation. Russia is killing its own culture, its own uh, memory. It's, uh, it's an amazing act. It's an amazing suicidal act. Russia is ending up in self-immolation, actually very much like it did in uh, 1917, almost 100 years ago, another act of political suicide of the entire country. But now it's happening before our eyes and at the core of it once again, are not some specific interests, geopolitical interests, economic interests, but a set of ideas. And therefore I'm saying that this is the clear case for constructivism. When uh, a group of people have imagined the world, have imagined the international relations in a specific way and started to, and started um, uh, the war because of this. Uh, and, um, uh, therefore, is uh, if you follow the, the whole script of the story, uh, the original uh, Russian um, pretext for this war, absolutely bizarre, uh, absolutely absurd. It is the denazification of Ukraine, fighting the Ukrainian fascists. And it's not just propaganda. The soldiers fighting this war honestly believe that there are some caricature fascists hiding in Ukrainian villages and houses. In many instances, the Ukrainians uh, who have been under Russian occupation are telling all the soldiers running into the houses with machine guns and asking, so where are the fascists hiding in your house? So uh, it's uh, the total indoctrination of the entire country by a totally absurd, fictitious idea called fascism. Russia is seeking for fascism in Ukraine without noticing that Russia herself has become a fascist country. And I will say a few words about this. Uh, the problem is that Russia of this century, Russia under Putin is a country not living in the present. It's a country living in the past. And that was one of the main achievements of Putin's policy throwing the entire country into the past, the retro politics of Putin. Putinism is a kind of retro politics. He is uh, driven by the imagination of Russia's glorious past, of uh, Russia moving from his victory to victory, always combating the West, um, being alone and defeating fascism and uh, being unjustly uh, unjustly treated at the end of the Cold War. So um, like uh, Hitler in Germany in the 1920s, uh, Putin uh, instilled in the minds of Russia the ideas of a historical defeat in the Cold War. Uh, if you remember, his one of the most uh, quoted pronouncement was um, that uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, which in itself is an amazing pronouncement. Um, uh, there were like bigger catastrophes, like the First World War, like the Second World War, like the Holocaust, uh, like you know, ethnic cleansings. Uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union did not really bear a huge human loss, 
Yes, there were wars. There was the uh, Karabakh war. There were wars in Central Asia. You know, there were wars in the Georgian territory, uh, Seti, Abkhazia, and so on. But you know, the combined human loss in the, in these wars is nothing compared to the Second World War, for instance. But no, for Putin, this was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe. And what he did is he uh, made Russians feel insulted. And offended. I remember how um, some 15 years ago I was uh, driving in the streets of Moscow and I suddenly saw a big billboard saying za ruskich, za biednych, for the Russians for the poor and I was like stopped and uh, I couldn't believe my eyes. I, it didn't just fit in my head. Why are Russians the poor Russians? The big war. This was um, actually the billboard of the godfather of Putin's regime, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, uh, the caricature Russian fascist who just passed away uh, in April. Uh, uh, he died of coma and he was in, he died of COVID. He was in coma for the past uh, months before his death. So he barely had witnessed the beginning of the war in Ukraine, which he had long predicted and wanted. Anyway, for the Russians, for the poor ones. Uh, and uh, oh, I was thinking, Jesus Christ, I mean, the, there are people in the former Soviet Union which suffered much, much more than, the, than, than, than Russia in the entire breakup. Then Russia, which was awash in petrodollars, which was, you know, one of the most prosperous cities on earth, Moscow. Uh, so you're just standing in the middle of this uh, thriving, prosperous city, and suddenly somebody is telling you, you were, you know, the poor guys. And then, you know, it was becoming clear, the TV propaganda was telling the people that we are the suffering ones, that nobody understands us, nobody wants us. We suffered a terrible defeat by losing the Soviet Union, and we should take back what is ours. So uh, the idea of uh, revanchism, the idea of imperial ressentiment was planted into Russians' heads and uh, hearts uh, a long time ago. It started uh, as an official state policy uh, with the rise of Putin. So I would say the mid uh, 2000s, uh, already in 2007, Putin had his uh, speech, uh, the Munich speech, uh, saying that, you know, nobody should meddle in the Russian geopolitical sphere of influence. In August of 2008, the Russian tanks rolled into Georgia. So there was a war between Russia and Georgia uh, for uh, South Ossetia. So um, uh, the, uh, that's been, we've faced uh, at least 15, if not 20 years of continuous brainwashing and propaganda uh, that was uh, inspiring revanchism and post-imperial ressentiment in the hearts uh, of the Russians. So uh, uh, in the end, uh, Russia became uh, a country totally obsessed with the past, obsessed with its own victory. And we've uh, developed a specific sets of beliefs and rituals, which in Russian is called Pabedebitia. Uh, which is, you know, becoming crazy, becoming obsessed with victory. So uh, you, of course, have seen these photographs of uh, processions uh, of Russian women and children dressed up in war uniforms, wearing the St. George's ribbons of this, you know, terrible uh, you know, prams, uh, child prams uh, disguised as tanks or oh, Katyusha uh, rocket launchers. Uh, they have kids' beds uh, also. They are built as tanks. And uh, there are these terrible rituals in every kindergarten and every school, uh, sometimes around this May celebrations, uh, the victory holiday. All kids are dressed up in uniform and, you know, uh, wearing all these medals and uh, assembling and the disassembling uh, Kalashnikov machine guns. So the rituals of militarism even before the start of this war, right? Because now what's happening now, it's like, it's complete uh, fascist hysteria what's going on. And, you know, everyone is obliged to wear the Suzette uh, letters and uh, kids at schools uh, writing letters to soldiers uh, fighting in the army and the entire schools and uh, 
you know houses and uh, enterprises are collecting uh, you know and dispatching uh they're sending stuff uh, to the people in the army from socks uh, to foodstuffs and then you know every kid is compelled to write a letter to the soldier saying you know hold out there in the front and defeat fascists and come back alive and so on so but um once again you have to understand that this was going on this was uh pumped uh through the russian population already for 15 years at least all these sorts of celebrations uh when uh, we saw this uh, you know cars in disguise you know so many cars were wearing this uh stickers uh in berlin uh we're going to take berlin uh, we can repeat it 1941 1945 and of course uh, the proverbial спасибо деду за победу Thank you, Grandpa, for the victory. So I think you know millions of cars in Russia were wearing the sticker for already a decade, uh, as well as millions of uh, cars in Russia were wearing the sticker of Kalashnikov on the rear of your window, AK-47, AK-47. Kalashnikov has become the quintessential Russian symbol rather than Matryoshka, rather than the Sputnik, rather than Gagarin, rather than Pushkin. So the country has identified itself with a assault rifle, with a weapon. There was a, uh, I don't have the photo here, I should have inserted this, you know, a big memorial to Kalashnikov uh, in the center of Moscow. So which was uh, opened by the same minister Medinsky about uh, five or seven years ago. So, uh, and you see this, uh, all this uh, paraphernalia of symbols, look at this, you know, Land Cruiser here, 1941, 1945, thank you, Dad, for the, thank you, Grandpa, for the victory, the Soviet Union, USSR, Ruski Nizdayutsa, so the Russians now get up with the T-34 tank, and there were so many of these cars, you know, roaming the streets and honking and uh, carrying red flags all the time. Well, for instance, look at this. This is uh, the Polk, uh, the Immortal Regiment, uh, big processions. This is a totally religious ritual. Uh, the, uh, uh, the thing is that uh, the uh, victory cult in Russia has become a real religion. It has in a way replaced orthodoxy as the state religion. And it has its own temples, its own churches, I will show you in the next slide. And it has its own processions, like, you know, in any religious cult, uh, like people are walking around carrying icons. So in this sense, too, people are carrying the icons, the portraits of their relatives uh, which fought in war or were killed in war. But, you know, as happens with any state cult, Gradually, the people carrying their own relatives is replaced by people carrying somebody's portrait. So in the end, all these huge processions of Bismirtne Polk, the immortal regiment, the way it's called, um, is replaced by, you know, people herded from enterprises, students from universities, and they are assembling at squares where the organizers are giving them portraits of somebody they don't know. And they just walk around the street carrying the portraits of somebody you don't know. And when the demonstration is over, they simply throw them away um, in piles. And uh, there's the whole iconography and there is the entire, um, I would say, uh, uh, the uh, mythology of uh, those dead people. These dead people are ruling Russia, the portraits of which we see. In the name of the dead, wars are fought, people are sent to prison. Uh, because uh, insulting the veterans, insulting the war memory is now a military crime, uh, not a military, um, a criminal uh, affair, criminal case in Russia. All right, uh, you're going to prison uh, if you're offending any of these portraits, any of these people. And um, these icons are also living their own lives, uh, like the icons in the Christian mythology. Um, I didn't, uh, uh, yeah, I'll probably, uh, as you ask questions, if I have a second, I'll try to Google, I could show there's a, so there was a short video, which was uh, circulating in Russia about 
five, seven years ago about uh, the portrait of the um, this uh, immortal regiment, the portrait of a nurse from the war times. So the uh, whole story of this uh, video is like this. So there is a girl uh, talking on the phone to her boyfriend and she is uh, pregnant. And she's telling her boyfriend uh, that she's pregnant. And the guy on the other side of the line says, you should make an abortion. And the girl says, oh, abortion. OK, yes, I will probably have to make an abortion. We don't want kids. And she hangs up. And at this moment, she has a portrait behind her, a portrait of her whatever grandmother, who is uh, pictured as a um, nurse during the Second World War. And then the portrait starts talking to her. It's rather like in this whole Russian story is about the talking icons. The portrait talks to her saying, you know, don't make an abortion, give birth to a child. You will have a son and he'll be a warrior. He will defend the motherland. And the girl says, oh, okay, yes, then I will not make an abortion. So, uh, and then, you know, the whole father thing, he disappears from the story. So, so often happens in Russia, you know, men just, you know, make kids and disappear. So the girl then carries the child, uh, gives birth to a child, and then, uh, you know, she's shown going to whatever, some military parade, military demonstration with a small boy, and he is, you know, a happy young defender of the motherland. So, and it's, it's amazing, it's, it's, it's anti-abortion, it's anti-abortion video, but uh, in, in sense, it's based on a memory and it's based on the quasi-Christian mythology of a speaking icon. So the icon uh, sort of dissuades the girl from making an abortion and from um, uh, bearing new life. So uh, that's uh, the way it looks. And here's the uh, um, uh, army temple, Hram Baruzhon Naksil, consecrated uh, the uh, temple of the armed forces, consecrated in um, uh, 2020 in the village of Kubinka. Uh, outside Moscow, there is a huge uh, military ground there. There's a huge military theme park. They are called Park Patriot, the Patriot Park. So, you know, tens of thousands of people come there every day to see the tanks, you know, then kids can ride tanks and, you know, you can shoot from rifles and their memorials and their like exercises. It's, it, it, it's another crazy thing when, you know, really tens of thousands come not to, to whatever, to a zoo, to, you know, simply to nature, uh, to some exploration. They just come there, they bring their kids to explore uh, the military equipment. Uh, so, and there they built uh, the army temple, Hram Varozhon uh, which as you see from its architecture is absolutely uh, threatening and menacing, uh, looks uh, like some, you know, from Star Wars, uh, this whole aesthetic of this, uh, this church. It's very dark, it's dark in color, it's painted in camouflage colors, uh, and uh, it's totally mystical in its purpose because it's consecrated to victory in, in 1945, and uh, it's full of numerical mm, mm, uh, codes which are written inside this. For instance, it is 75 meters tall, which is consecrating, consecrated to the 75th anniversary of uh, victory. Uh, the diameter of its dome, it's 14 meters, 18 centimeters, which corresponds to 1,418 days of the Second World War, of the Great Patriotic War. Uh, then, I don't know, like the number of tiles in the mosaic in inside uh, the main uh, church uh, you know, there is the same as the number of the heroes of the Soviet Union awarded during the Second World War. And there are like a dozen of such um, numerical correspondences, numerical codes, which is written inside this. This really reminds an obsession, for instance, of uh, German Nazis with uh, mysticism, uh, with numbers and uh, with numerology. Uh, before the opening, uh, it had the mosaics of Stalin, Putin, uh, Minister Shoigu, Speaker of the uh, Council of the Federation of the Russian Senate, Valentina Matvienko, on the walls. 
but uh, when uh, the photographs leaked into press, there was a scandal and on the last minute before the opening, they uh, covered this mosaics of Stalin and Putin. But what remained, what is also true, is that the entry steps uh, uh, to the cathedral are made from German trophy weaponry. So they borrowed the German tanks and arms and guns from the uh, Museum of the Armed Forces. So that's a trophy weaponry from 1945, and they've welded it into this mill into the uh, steps. So as you enter uh, the as you enter the church, you walk on the German uh, uh, army, uh, German arms from 1945. Inside the temple, there is some really absurd relics. Go, Kelvin. For instance, there is Hitler's uniform. Uh, Hitler's hat, which was obtained by the Soviet forces from Hitler's bunker in Berlin in 1945. So this is kept inside the church as a relic uh, of, of this church. So it just shows you the, the uh, extent of obsession with victory, of how victory has replaced any reality in, in, uh, in Russia. Russia has really just been thrown back into 1945. Russia in, 19, in 2022 lives in 1945 in reality, reliving the same victory day after day after day, saying, yes, we had the victory, we are victorious, we've defeated the fascists, we will always defeat the fascists. The world around us is fascist, and uh, we are the only country which can stand up to the challenge of fascism in the world. Americans are fascists, Ukrainians are fascists, uh, I don't know, like Georgians are fascists, uh, Europea, Europe is fascist, Europe, you know, they're Jewish fascists, they are gay fascists, and we are the only ones that, you know, they fight the fascists. So that's the kind, I, I know it sounds absurd, which, which I'm saying now, but this is the kind of litany um, that the Russian propaganda is going over and over. Uh, a religion cult uh, would not be complete without its saints and with absolutely fictitious stories. For instance, this is one, to give you an example. The 28 Panfil of Heroes. I, as a schoolboy, uh, I think, you know, David and, you know, many people, everyone who grew up in the Soviet Union, of course, have this mythology, Geroi Panfilovci, the Panfil of Heroes. So this is an apocryphal story from December 1941, when uh, supposedly a small regiment of 28 soldiers stopped a German tank division. Uh, as it goes, uh, the 28 soldiers, they all died, but uh, they destroyed something like 70 German tanks. And uh, as kids, we grew up with this. There are streets named after them in every Russian city. There are monuments to them everywhere. Uh, this is somewhere outside of Moscow, Razyez Dubasekova. But then there was an investigation of this whole thing already in 1942. And uh, the military attorneys came to the conclusion that this whole story is invented. It's fictitious. Because after this war, these people emerged and many of these dead 28 heroes were indeed alive. They served in the army. Some were even captured. Some were even, you know, turned up to fascists. So they, uh, they became collaborants. So they were in the fascist army. And some were happily living after the war uh, as, as war veterans, which, and according to the Soviet propaganda, they were supposed to be all dead. So the whole myth was revealed. But no, in the Soviet Union, it still persisted. In the Soviet Union, it was a sacred issue. Nobody could touch it. But now in the post-Soviet uh, world, uh, the director of the state archive, Sergei Miranenko, spoke on several occasions, showing documents from 1945, from 1946, saying this was all invented by the journalists, by the correspondence of the Krasna Zvezda newspaper in January 1942. So that's a totally invented story. And you know what? The state authorities said, no, wait, we do not touch the story. They fired the director of the state archive and the then culture minister Vladimir Medinsky spoke up saying that uh, a mythology which has uh, informed so many generations is more important than the actual facts of war. So this is once again, a fact of religion saying that uh, you know a myth is more important than reality. Uh, and um, another uh, myth uh, which um, 
inform the people in this war is the return of Stalin. Uh, and I think this will also be very interesting uh, to the people in Georgia. Uh, uh, the fact that Stalin was in a way resurrected and taken from the dustbin of history, uh, where he was laying uh, for a couple of post-Soviet generations and uh, presented as the key uh, architect of the Soviet victory and indeed one of the key uh, figures in the Soviet and Russian history. So uh, there's this uh, quest for order. There is a quest for Stalinism uh, inside Russia, and especially not only among the, some old pensioners and people of 60, 70 years of age, uh, which grew up under the Soviet propaganda. No, the young generation are happily embracing the Stalin mythology. Like Stalin is portrayed, uh, Stalin in young years, in his terrorist years, he is portrayed as some kind of a hipster, like wearing this, uh, you know, a hipster haircut, uh, like a sort of a beard, uh, this uh, unshaped uh, face, um, and so on. So amazingly enough, Stalin, uh, I think uh, similar things are happening in Georgia and uh, we'll be glad to discuss it if uh, you wish after, after the lecture. Uh, Stalin is becoming a brand of Russia, uh, a uh, epitome of uh, the way that Russia can threaten the outside world, uh, a fear that Russia hopes, aims to produce for the outside world as its uh, prime export commodity. So uh, uh, the whole mythology is uh, really uh, can be summarized in the words uh, we can repeat it. So as I mentioned already for 15 years at least, uh, the streets of Russia were dotted with this car uh, stickers. We can repeat it. 1941, 1945, we can repeat it. Here you see uh, really repeating this. Uh, they have for 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea and occupied Donbass. Uh, so they repeated Russia raping America in this sense. And here we see uh, exchange uh, my car for a tank. I see they come to see my grandmother in Ukraine. Uh, 1941, 1945, we can repeat it. So this could be from, you know, years ago, this whole thing. People already back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, were dreaming of coming in tanks to Ukraine. So uh, this sort of ideology. And mm, you also, for the younger generation, uh, for the, um, it would be interesting to understand the change which happened in the Russian mind. Because uh, for decades after the Second World War, the main Russian uh, idea of the war was uh, phrased in, in, a, um, in a sentence, Lish by ne bola vajny. let there never be war. So the entire generations of my grandparents, of my parents, my generation, as we grew as school kids in the Soviet schools in the late Soviet Union, we were saying peace. We were saying the war was a terrible tragedy which never can be repeated. I mean, these four words uh, uh, have really uh, inspired the entire Soviet propaganda. And then in the 21st century, suddenly this anti-war sentiment turned 180 degrees and became a pro-war sentiment. It turned into Mojum Povtarit. We can repeat it. Let's replay the war. Let's do the war once again. So that's interesting how the politics of uh, resentment, of revanchism, have totally changed the ideological codes from Lishbunya Blavaini to Mojum Povtarit. So, and they, as you see here, indeed, they repeated it. They attempted to repeat it. So uh, many uh, Russian tanks in the streets of Ukrainian cities and Ukrainian roads are carrying, indeed, not Russian, but Soviet flags. They are carrying the past. They're carrying the dream of the Soviet empire, resurrecting the Soviet empire. So the omnipresent letter Z and the Soviet flag uh, on board uh, this stamp, uh, this tank. So uh, summing up, uh, I have to say that uh, Russia, when fighting fascism, has uh, turned into a fascist country itself. And uh, the letter Z, I think, is a good testimony. 
It plays the same role as a swastika for the Germans. It is a symbol which has suddenly become very popular, which has united the country. So, uh, uh, but this is not pure fascism. I think there is, a, and the, you've probably had it already in your discussions of the past few days, but uh, we have a discussion here in Russia. Uh, can we call today's Russia fascist? And uh, of course, you know that Timothy Snyder had a uh, very interesting article early in June in the New York Times called, uh, now we can say it in open, Russia is fascist. And uh, I think uh, since then, uh, the um, uh, idea was that Russia is not just pure fascism, but it is what is called schizofascism, schizophrenic fascism, uh, in which you say, that the fascist is the other, while you yourself, the fascist is you yourself. So people have this double consciousness. Well, country is repeating uh, the rituals of reliving the rituals of fascism itself. It's externalizing it. It's saying fascist is the other, the fascists are the Ukrainians. But if um, we look at the classical definitions of fascism, we'll see that Russia meets many of the key characteristics of this. Uh, and first and foremost is that this is a country living in memory because fascism is also a kind of retro politics. Fascism is a politics of memory. The original Italian fascism, because it's the member, the memory of the Roman empire of the greatness of Italy at the times of the Roman Empire, and even the word fascism, right? It's come from uh, fascio. Uh, this is uh, the lictor's bunch in the ancient Rome. Uh, so there is a bunch of sticks uh, with an X in the middle, which is uh, uh, tied together by a ribbon. So it's called in fascio. And uh, this is a Roman artifact from the Roman policemen, Roman lictors. Uh, ancient Rome, I mean. So uh, Italian fascism, fascism is a painting of the past. The German fascism, of course, also is a totally mythological thing. It's uh, the obsession with the greatness of the Aryan race, the obsession with the greatness of uh, the German history, because as you know, the German fascism, fascism grows out of uh, 19th century German romanticism. The idea of German heritage, Blut und Erbe, blood and heritage. Uh, these are the slogans of the German fascism. And Russian fascism is also about the blood and heritage. It's because the Russian blood and uh, you know now the uh, crusade to liberate the Ukrainians is a crusade uh, for you know the Russian blood, the common blood of the three people, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian. And it's about the memory the memory of the Russian Empire and the memory of the Soviet victories. Fascism was built, built based on the idea of the unity of the nation, much like the today's uh, Russian ideology is about the unity of the nation. Uh, the superiority of the Russian nation. So we see this with respect to Ukrainians, uh, because at this point, uh, as a Russian political analyst, uh, Vladimir Kostokov said, uh, the Russian fascism is indeed becoming Nazism because it has a racial component in it. Uh, as you see now uh, in Russia, there's the idea of the dominance of the Russian race and the Ukrainians being the lower race. Uh, they are a nation, uh, they're a non-nation. They're the people which are not uh, worthy of their state not worthy of their culture, not worthy of their language. And uh, the Russian soldiers and the Russian authorities uh, in the occupied region are behaving much the way that the Germans behaved on the occupied territories in the Second World War. They are destroying any signs of local indigenous culture because there's so many, much testimony when the Russian soldiers, when they are filtrating uh, the Ukrainian civilians they're singling out the teachers of Ukrainian language. Uh, anyone carrying the national symbols, like, you know, it's like in the concentration camps when the Russian, uh, you know, take the Ukrainians through the filtration camps, they undressed 
uh, the people and dress everyone and they search the bodies of the ukrainians for the tattoos uh, that would have uh, uh the ukrainian national insignia the flag the uh you know any slavo ukraini uh, the words uh the trident uh, the ukrainian symbol so anyone that says this same carrying ukrainian symbols is taken away and uh, supposedly executed and uh, the teachers of ukrainian uh, language are executed and then people are going exactly like in the German filtration camps uh, in this huge filtration camps on the borders through which hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are exposed. And after this, uh, the Ukrainians are sent to, to live and resettle in the remote regions of Russia uh, without documents and with an obligation to stay there. So it's like the Germans did with the Osterweiter it's like stealing the whole groups of people and moving them to live and work in the remote regions of Germany. Some Ukrainians managed to escape and, you know, the whole groups of uh, volunteers that hate Russia, that help Ukrainians escape uh, from these remote settlements and uh, uh, transport them to Europe. But uh, the thing is that uh, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are sent to live in uh, places like Sakhalin or Kamchatka or the uh, East Siberian regions um, simply for being Ukrainian, simply for being uh, the people of uh, inferior race uh, like uh, the Germans uh, treated. So in a way, the Ukrainians are uh, amazingly enough, uh, which first was said to be the brotherly people, but now in the Russian discourse, they have turned to the underclass, to the under people, like the Jews for the Germans in the 1930s and the 1940s. So, uh, and if you read to the speeches of Putin, Medvedev, the ideologists of Russian fascism, like for instance, the now uh, famous Timofey Sergeyev, uh, who was writing the Ria Novosti. So Russia is seeking the end losing, the final solution of the Ukrainian question, like Hitler was uh, looking for the final solution of the Jewish question. It is not yet the total extermination of Ukrainians as physical bodies, but it is the, Ukraine, the destruction of the state the destruction of the nation, the destruction of uh, culture, and uh, you know any uh, human life on uh, on the on this territory, and uh, just you know read the Twitter of uh, Dmitry Medvedev, who has become uh, the arch uh, the ideologist of war uh, these days. So. Uh, uh, in this sense, I would say this rootedness in memory makes uh, today's Russia very much a fascist country. And uh, uh, the, uh, but there's an important uh, definition there. So first, it is not, of course, the pure fascism of 20th century, uh, because it lacks an important component. There's no mobilization potential. The fascism of... Uh, Mussolini, of Hitler, of, uh, in a way, Stalin. I would say Stalin, too, was fascist, although it was under the guise of the communist ideology was supposed to fight fascists. But the organization of the state and the ideology of the state was very much fascist. But the ideologies of the 30s and 40s mobilized tens of millions of people. People could raise up and die for the cause which is not the case in Russia these days. It is increasingly difficult to find people ready to die for memory, ready to die for fascism. Uh, it's a fun story when people watch it on TV, when they watch the military parade in the Red Square on the 9th of May, when they watch reports of Russian jet fighters and bombers flying over Syria and bombing people in Syria. They enjoy, uh, you know, these fake uh, reports by the, the Ministry of Defense about destroying fascists in Ukraine. But they're not willing just to give up everything and go fight in the war, go die in Ukraine. Uh, despite the fact that the Russian uh, state pays uh, supposedly large money uh, for the people. So, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, unimaginable in a fascist country when you have to pay people to go fight, to go die. So in a sense, uh, we have to say that this is uh, fake fascism. And uh, like so many things in Russia are fake. The entire Russian history is based on fakes, you can say. 
Potemkin villages. It's a uh, typical Russian invention. So we have uh, the pseudo institutions. We have uh, the appearances of things. So in this case, we have the appearance of fascism. We see fascism on TV. We see fascism in this red flags. We see fascism in the name of which people are killed, are killed in Ukraine. But deep inside, um, this is no longer a mobilizing uh, and the structuring ideology, which can change the society. It's yet another fake which is used by the authorities, which is used by the Putin regime to prolong its power, to, to protract their power, to preserve uh, the corrupt system, which has been ruling Russia already for the past, <clears throat> uh, for the past 20 years. So um, as a final uh, conclusion to all this, uh, in describing the state of the society and the state of the regime, I have to say that they are driven by memory and uh, they have uh, produced a local fascist. Some people, I don't like the word Russism, uh, but they've produced a peculiar local sort of fascism, which they call Russism or schizofascism. But for me, first and foremost, this is a fake fascism. A fake fascism, uh, which is used to consolidate the Russian society, to uh, threaten the world, because uh, threatening the world is uh, one of the key Russian assets. That's what Russia does best, sending threats to the world, being a menace to the world. And now it's working quite well. We see how it works quite well, how Putin has once again managed to capitalize it. And uh, in the end, to protract Putin's power, because he is now the undisputed ruler. He is a ruler of the war nation, the nation for the time being united at war. So what is to be done here? Where do we go from here? Uh, so my um, uh, thing is my, uh, the problem is my vision of the situation is that uh, Russia has not yet lost its empire. That's the problem. The problem is that Russia is still an imperialist nation. There were two attempts to break up the Russian empire, one in 1917, another in 1991. And both of them were partially successful. Parts of former empire have fallen off Finland, Poland uh, in uh, um, 1917, uh, Eastern Europe in 1991, uh, the independent states uh, from the Baltic states uh, to Georgia, to Ukraine in 1991. But Russia has never come up, uh, come to grips uh, with these losses. Russia could never accept these losses. So we see now how imperial ideology now disguised as revanchism and fascism is ruling Russia. So Russia at some point, I don't know at which point, uh, has to be defeated, militarily defeated in order it has to cease being an empire. Unless Russia is in, uh, ceases becoming an empire, it will forever be a threat to the outside world. You know, a peace can be achieved in Ukraine these days. For instance, you know, Putin can uh, convince uh, uh, his Western counterparts and, you know, make Ukrainians uh, accept peace at some point, taking Crimea, taking parts of Eastern Ukraine. But we all understand this is a temporary peace. It will take another several years before Russia breaks again. And we don't know where, in Georgia, in South Caucasus, in the Baltic states against Moldova, against Poland. We don't know. So uh, this is an inherent problem. The problem has to be dealt with structurally. Russia has to be dismantled as an imperial power, not as a state. I'm not calling for the complete destruction of the Russian state or for the occupy. I don't think the world can occupy Russia the way it occupied Germany in 1945. But uh, the situation is largely similar. So there should be a concerted action by the surrounding world to uh, impose a military defeat upon Russia. And I think the world is working in this direction already. If the war goes on for another year, I think uh, the Russian army will simply cease to exist. Uh, 
there will be no more uh, ammunition and no more people left in Russia. They are already assembling people there, like from the cities, like each city sends its own uh, brigade and division. Uh, and, uh, you know, they have uh, to basically, you know, uh, invite people, lure them by high, uh, supposedly high salaries just to be, or well, they are now taken prisoners. Uh, right, as you know, there are now thousands of people from the colonies, uh, from Russian prisons, uh, they are recruited in Russia and sent uh, to fight in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, they are even uh, buried anonymously. They are buried under their nicknames, without even proper names, uh, the criminals which are sent uh, to, to fight in Ukraine. So Russia has to be uh, defeated militarily. Uh, it has to be uh, de-imperialized in the future for the normal Russian state and nation states to emerge instead of empire, because Russia never had an experience of being a nation state. It was always an empire. So Russia has to be given a chance to become a proper nation state. Uh, second thing which we need is a decolonization. Uh, the decolonization of uh, the post-Soviet space, which Russia still treats as its own colony and we have to understand that what's happening now is an imperialist war in the colonial war. Russia has been fighting colonial wars uh, for, the, for the past 20 years in Abkhazia, in, uh, in Ossetia, in uh, Transnistria, in uh, uh, Ukraine these days, in Crimea. Uh, so um, uh, Russia has to be decolonized, uh, finally de-Sovietized. What we see here in this picture is a Soviet flag. So in the end, Russia was not really de-Sovietized. And it's interesting that now in Ukraine, they are reconstructing Lenin's monuments in Ukraine. So one of the main achievements of Ukraine of the past 20 years was the destruction of 5,000 monuments to Lenin. Now the occupation authorities are restoring Lenin's monuments all over Ukraine. So Russia has to be de-Sovietized. And finally, my final judgment is that Russia has to be denazified. Russia has to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, relieved of the fascist and Nazi ideology uh, under which it now lives. So uh, my final uh, solution, my final judgment on all things is the de-imperialization, decolonization, de-Sovietization and the denazification of Russia. So a war which started as a crusade for the denazification of Ukraine indeed should eat, should end as the war for the denazification of Russia. And only at this point uh, we can lay at rest the memory of the World War II which has uh, inspired this uh, war in Ukraine.